What's up, everybody? Welcome back for some more NFL DFS picks and lineup advice, this time for the Monday night two-game slate on DraftKings and FanDuel. We have the Miami Dolphins and the Tennessee Titans. We have the Seattle Seahawks and the Detroit Lions. And we're here to break it all down for you. Welcome. I am Brian Jester, co-founder here at Occupy Fantasy, joined by the architect of our lineup builder at Occupy Fantasy and notorious short slate crusher. It is Jack. Jack, good morning, sir. How are you? How's it going? Good morning, Brian. I'm doing well. Got all my uh, beverages here in the morning, ready to record before work. Um, two weeks in a row of just doing this at home like normal. I think we're, we'll definitely have to switch it up next time, you know, but for now, we're, we're standing straight up. How are you doing this morning? I'm good, man. I got my V8 Energy, which is still not sponsored the show, but uh, I am good to go and feeling good for this show. So all you new viewer, viewers out there, all you returning viewers, welcome back. What we're going to do in this video, we will go team by team, Tennessee, Miami, Detroit, Seattle, talk about the injuries that impact the slate. Uh, discuss some of the higher and lower owned players from each team on the two game slate with some showdown notes mixed in. Then we will transition and talk about the three core strategies for two game slates. This two game slate could not be any more different than last Monday's two game slate. So you want to stick around for that segment as we talk about why. And at the end, we'll go each showdown slate, Tennessee, Miami and Seattle, Detroit, give a couple takes for both DraftKings and FanDuel and some strategies we're thinking about for that. So make sure you stick around and tune in until the very end. Uh, so Jack, just really quickly, before we do get into team by team and the strategies, maybe discuss why this slate is so much different than last week's. Yeah, the pricing. Uh, last week, we we made jokes about it. It was literally almost like a pick em. You could just play anyone you want. Of course, the super extensive chalky players basically all got there. Um, unfortunate. Uh, this week, though, we're not going to see that again because the pricing is is more probably like it should be. Um, and I think we see that both in the in the two game and the showdown, right? When we run ownership. Absolutely. I mean, in the second game in ownership in uh, in uh, in showdown, we were trying to figure out how the field is even going to play this. The pricing is incredibly tight. I personally prefer these slates. It makes it a lot uh, easier to know what the field is going to do. A lot easier to build leverage and a lot easier to deploy our short slate strategy. So I'm really excited for that. Let's jump into team by team. We'll start Tennessee and Miami. Uh, for Tennessee side, missing their defensive tackle, Jeffrey Simmons. Obviously, that is not great against a great rushing team like Miami. Uh, Tennessee is also missing one of their top corners who was put on injured reserve. And their other cornerback is extremely questionable. So not something you want to see if you're going up against Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. Uh, they also have a safety uh, hooker who is probably going to play. So nothing too crazy there. A couple defensive injuries that bumps Miami offense. Uh, and Jack, Miami's offense could use all the bumping they could possibly get because Tua is still on injured reserve, which means Tyler Huntley is going to start tonight. He was not even on the team to start the regular season. Tyler Huntley used to be in Baltimore, has a lot of rushing ability. He will start tonight, see if he can give that offense a spark in Tua's absence. Probably the biggest absence, though, is Teron Armstead, their offensive tackle. He is out. That's a big downgrade to their offense. Uh, Raheem Mostert's the biggest question mark on the entire slate, if he's going to play or not. Limited practice all week. Questionable. Miami's been kind of notorious for keeping conservative returns to play for some of these guys. And if you listen to what Mike McDaniel said, it said that Mostert is trying as hard as he wants to get out there, but they're going to be smart about it. Reading between the lines, that likely means he'll sit tonight. So we'll see Jeff Wilson and Jalen Wright as the backups once again. Uh, and not to be outdone, Miami has their own defensive injuries. Cornerback Kendall Fuller is out. We can bump the Seattle receivers in our projections because of that. Their middle linebacker is out. So, uh, And the one player that may return, make his debut, is Malik Washington. He's a wide receiver three, a wide receiver four. Could be used as a, as a, in a gadget role at this point in his career. So just monitor that, mostly for showdown purposes. But Jack, lots of injuries to digest for this, uh, at least for this first game. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is tough. I mean, the, I think you, what do you do with the Miami passing game? I mean, um, we saw showed a two gamer with Tyreek Hill. It was like what eighty five percent owned last year, and in this slate we have him. I mean, he'll still get like up to maybe forties, but um, what do you do with that? Right? I mean, Tennessee's got a good defense. They got a bunch of injuries though. Does is Huntley gonna throw the ball more than twenty times? Like, I don't know. What, what's your initial lean in on the the Miami passing game? I wish I had a lean. I, I really don't know, right? Is Mike McDaniel just going to lean into his rushing ability, right? I think a, a smart coach would be like, you know what? We can't get anything going passing in my offense. Let's just run what Huntley can do. And I'm not saying Huntley can't pass. Huntley's a decent passer too, right? But, you know, maybe he's running a bunch of read options, a bunch of uh, uh, rollouts, RPOs, things like that. I don't know if it'll happen. So, and I honestly think Tyreek might go even lower than that because of his pricing, because of how highly priced he still is on this slate. I mean, you look at last week, Tyreek Hill, 
just seven points. Two weeks ago, six points. The field's not going to be rushing to play him, Jack, when another quarterback is under center. So I think we could see him low 20s, uh, depending on the contest that you're in. Yeah, I bet you, especially those like uh, higher dollar small field ones, he'd play right. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, Miami is one way you could get different tonight. Um, I, as you guys will see, it's probably not our favorite way, um, but it is one way, and there's going to be a few different ways you can do it tonight just because of, you know, how, how tough the pricing is. Um, so, yeah, what about uh, what about the other side? Yeah, tennis. That's maybe where our excitement is. Uh, I, yeah, unfortunately, this is where our excitement is on this two game slate, Tennessee. <laughs> We have uh, we do have an underperforming wide receiver on Tennessee's side. It is Calvin Ridley. He scored about 15 fantasy points less than what uh, he should have scored based on his opportunities where they've occurred on the field. And again, as I talked about this in last week's videos, this could be because of overthrown balls, poorly thrown balls, drops, unfortunate where they get tackled. Uh, and sometimes we'll have guys like Brandon Cooks who doesn't score any points, but sometimes Jack will have guys like Cortland Sutton and George Pickens who have really good games as they did yesterday on our underperforming wide receivers list. Calvin Ridley feels like in a really good spot, especially with Miami missing a corner. Uh, and we have him projected under 20% on both sides. So Calvin Ridley is probably the best leverage play we could find. Yeah. I mean, the anytime you have an underperforming receiver on these two game slates, it's uh, especially when they're not 60% owned. Yes. Um, it's an automatic play. Um, what do you make of the, I was just looking at the, the wide receiver splits for these guys. Hopkins is only playing like half the snaps. Do you think that's just an injury thing or like what, what do you, do you have any expectations there tonight as far as like him rotating with the other guys? I think they're going to continue to try to ramp him up. Obviously he had that MCL injury in preseason. Didn't play much at all week one. Bumped that up in weeks two and three. Will he get up to 80, 90% of the snaps? I'm not sure. At least not this week. I don't know. But I think if anything, we err on the side of him getting more snaps. So uh, but they did use him when he was in the game, especially last week. So, yeah, Hopkins Hopkins is a guy I'm willing to use because you see projections higher on Tyler Boyd. We'll actually see Tyler Boyd pretty popular on this slate, right? Yeah, the pricing is weird, too. He's like he's sub 5K on FanDuel. I think he's still pretty cheap on DraftKings, too, right? Um, yep. That's a weird one. There's, there's a couple guys like that that stick out. I think in the second game we'll get to one, too. But, um, yeah, so, um, you know, Tennessee under four wide receiver, good target distribution. Um, Looks, looks fun. Miami's got some injuries on defense, right? Yeah. Uh, and it, just uh, just can't a wait to watch Levis throw it out of bounds 45 <laughs> times. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's good for great. at least one Will Levis play per game where he makes the most head-scratching possible play. As long as he mixes in some touchdowns with it as well, I'll be okay with that. Uh, highest owned guys on both sides in this game for the two-gamer. Uh, Devon Achan, obviously the highest priced running back on the slate, uh, especially if Raheem Mostert is ruled out later today. Again, we'll find out probably about 4 p.m. Uh, the Miami defense is going to be popular, obviously, against Will Levis. Uh, Tyreek is going to be somewhat popular, like we just said, anywhere between 20 to 40 percent, depending on how he gets steamed or if he doesn't get steamed. Uh, and then on Tennessee side, we have Tony Pollard, obviously. We have Tyler Boyd and DeAndre Hopkins, but not their wide receiver one, Calvin Ridley. So that, that is a, certainly uh, a symptom of the pricing dynamic here. Low owned guys on both sides. Tyler Huntley Jack under 20%, Jalen Waddle under 20%, John o. Smith under 20%, and then almost everyone that's actually good on Tennessee, Calvin Ridley, Tajay Spears, Will Levis, uh, and both their tight ends, which I think uh, will pop a little bit depending on the builds you're making. So, unlike last week, lots are actually good low owned plays. Yeah, now we talk about this a lot on these two gamers. Last week, it didn't really matter because of the pricing. Um, backup running backs. Um, so I, you know, I'm just, I like to just lightly look at like snap counts and targets and touches and Allard seems like a guy that could put up a goose egg. You know, he's not, it's not like he's getting 95% of the touches and snaps. Um, he lost four, let's see, four catches to Spears last week because they were, they were trailing. I mean, what do you think of, um, of those kind of plays? Like, for example, I don't know what the pricing difference is on drafting is, but FanDuel, uh, Pollard is 66 and Spears is 52, and then Miami is even crazier, right? A chance 8K, Wilson is 5K. So any, any thoughts on the back of running backs with the tight pricing tonight? Yeah, I think, I don't know if Jeff Wilson is going to outproduce A-Chan. They, they seem content just giving him the ball a ton when Mostert is out. But I think the obvious one is, is Pollard and, and Spears. Yeah, that pricing difference on DraftKings between those two, Pollard is 6K, Tajay Spears, $4,900. And if you think about season long, Tajay Spears was drafted a round or two after Pollard. So the expectation was that this would be a relatively split backfield anyways. Uh, and yeah, we have Spears at at least half the ownership of Pollard. So that, that is one good way to get different. I like that call. 
and you know to be clear like that's a large field play right i'm always thinking about the super large field um so but normally that's something that you know we've seen win many times in these large fields as like a backup running back um and it's not that they necessarily outscore the starter it's that they score six points and the starter scored seven points and they're 2k cheaper um okay any other thoughts on this game before we switch over no, I think that's it. Let's transition to Seattle and Detroit, which again starts 45 minutes later, like uh, like the two game slate did last week. Which means we don't have an opportunity for a late swap unless pure disaster occurs in the first 45 minutes of this first game. Uh, moving on, Seattle and Detroit. Uh, Seattle's injuries—they're missing uh, Leonard Williams, one of their top defensive linemen. Their backup defensive tackle is also out. Uh, one linebacker is out for Seattle. Another one is highly questionable. So we can bump up the Detroit tight ends and running backs based on that information. On Detroit side, Frank Ragnow, their center, is out. Uh, extremely funny wording from Dan Campbell when they said, uh, yeah, we're going to put down Ragnow this week like he was a sick dog. I don't know why he used that terminology, but Ragnow will not be playing. Obviously, their most important offensive lineman, so that's a slight get downgrade to Detroit's offense. Uh, Detroit also misses some defensive players as well. Their edge, Marcus Davenport, linebacker Barnes, is out, so bump Seattle's offense in that regard. Uh, and Jack, we do have one underperforming wide receiver in this game as well. It is Jamison Williams. So... First off, when you see Seattle and Detroit, I imagine we think that this will be the more popular game of the two. Yeah, I mean, the Vegas total reflects that. Um, the ownership reflects that. Projections, for, for sure. Um, and, you know, I think that's a good thing, right? In a sense that, like, it's not like we're dealing with Josh Allen like we were last week. I mean, Goff and Smith easily could not be optimal. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, right away that's kind of interesting to, like, it makes the other game seem more, more, more winnable. And, um, I mean, you know, do we see any low-owned – we talked about lots of low-owned receivers in the last game. No. Is, is that the case here, or is this, this where the chalk is? This is uh, – you know, as I put the notes together, as we did our projected ownership last night, highest owned on Seattle – I have all three receivers, their quarterback, their running back, and their tight end. And the sub-20% guys are the backups and the defense. On Detroit side, I wrote highest owned, all the receivers, all the running backs, the tight end, the quarterback, and the sub-20% guys are in quotes scrubs. So we know the ownership is going on this slate. It's not going to be a surprise. Yeah. And um, I mean, I guess this is the question for people, right? Like if you're playing, let's start with small field, right? Like you just play off and smith i mean the model usually always loves golf and he's always a good play i mean do you think you just go there and try to find a you know a pivot elsewhere um or are you looking to get away from this ownership even even in a small field it's a really good question no i mean you don't want to necessarily get away from the ownership because we do have so many low owned plays right there and once we get to the the strategy the three core strategy section here in a second we'll talk about the different ways you can uh, deploy these but I think there's so many different ways to play it that I don't think we have to necessarily hone in on one strategy and be like, oh, we have to play all these guys from this game or we have to play all the chalk or whatever. Because, Jack, our strategies, and let's just talk about it now, our strategies of leaving salary, our strategies of mega stacking one game, and our strategy of using lower own plays, all three are in play this week. Uh, if we talk about leaving salary, obviously that was the, the first thought last week when pricing was not even an issue. Look at it tonight, obviously it's really tight, but even some of the lineups I was building and some of the rules I put into our builder this morning, Jack, I still got some lineups with 1,500 left over, 2,000 left over. It's not an impossible slate to leave salary, and I think that is the one way that the field will not go this week. No, I, I'm with you. And yeah, when we talk about leaving salary this week, we, I mean, if, if you play a lineup that's got 1,500 left, that's going to be very unique because of the fact that pricing is so tough. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, you can just do things like stack off and bring a couple of bring backs and then play Calvin Ridley, Ridley as a low owned, you know, one off from the other game. You can do things like that. You don't have, you know, obviously we were talking Will Levis up. You don't have to just jam Will Levis and, and all, all of your lineups, but um, yeah. So just, just keep in mind if you're playing Detroit, like it's pretty chalky. Um, Seattle also, right. Let's, let's talk about that. I mean, what, why do we think Geno Smith and uh, Tyler Lockett are just massive chalk? Is it just a team total thing? Lack of, lack of other options. It's a team total thing. It is a pricing thing. Gino is only fifty nine hundred dollars. Tyler Lockett is five k. Uh, Jack across the industry, Tyler Lockett has a pretty good projection for his price. Why? I'm not sure. And as a result, because of his pricing, especially on Showdown, especially on DraftKings, especially on FanDuel, in the two gamer, I mean Lockett is going to be one of the highest on receivers, which is pure insanity. I'm sure he'll score a touchdown as a result, but uh, his ownership really doesn't make sense outside of pricing. That's the only way it makes sense. Yeah, I and actually I don't know what DraftKings has. FanDuel has their normal um 
100k up top on the late game. So I'm, I'm going to usually they have worse prize pools when they have the two gamer. But yep. uh, yeah, I think this game is super interesting from a showdown perspective. Um, and then, yeah, I think we should always talk about the Detroit running backs on these short slates, right? I mean, I the showdown I won week one, I used both of them in the flex, which was a unique build. Um, I, I mean, you can disagree with me, but I think that's absolutely in play here. Um, I, I probably would ask if you would keep using the rule you came up with, which is the sort of max two um, quarterback, same team running backs, where you might play golf in one of them or both of them, but not like all three. You think that's where you go tonight? Yeah, and, that? and I think including the defense in there in that rule as well, right? You don't want golf and Gibbs against Seattle's defense. You don't want both running backs against yep. Seattle's defense. I think that makes a ton of sense. That's a really good call, especially on a slate like this. Two guys who are going to get touches, high value touches, Gibbs and Montgomery together that a lot of people will not do. And as you said, you won in showdown with it before, so uh, just as recently as three weeks ago. So I think that's a really good call. And, and two gamer too, right? I mean, can Gibbs and Montgomery both outscore Tony Pollard? Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, yeah. like uh, Seattle's a run funnel, and Detroit. Uh, is missing a blocker. Who knows if that means they'll run more, but they usually might just run the ball 40 times, especially if they're winning, uh, which is another reason why, you know, some of these lower on quarterbacks in this two game are, are, are interesting too, right? Because it's a pretty run heavy team. Yep. Um, any low owned plays in this game at all that we're interested in? I guess one is here. I guess one is is Zach Charbonnet, right? He is basically the same price as Kenneth Walker. Kenneth Walker is returning tonight. All projection systems, rightfully so, have Kenneth Walker as the lead back in this game. But Walker is returning from injury, right? H- hadn't really gotten in any full practices after that oblique. Is there a chance they just split carries here? I think it's possible. Is it likely? Probably not. But if it's if it's a possibility, Jack, and Walker is 50 times the ownership, 20 times the ownership of Charbonnet, whatever it is, I think you have to at least consider Charbonnet as a, as a pivot away from, from Walker. And in, in the chance that – and it's not like Charbonnet was, was bad – in Walker's absence, he's actually pretty decent. So I think Charbonnet is a great 5% play in large field contests. Yeah, and obviously you talked about the Detroit injuries. I mean, Detroit is, is sort of like the most extreme pass funnel defense you can find. And I just, yeah, a running back returning from injury at 50% ownership that's expensive and might split carries like Walker. I mean, it's probably someone I'm not going to be uh, over the field on. And, and yeah, like same argument with the back of running backs, right? Salary's too, super tough. If the backup is 2K cheaper, Charbonnet, and he gets 10 touches, like that might be enough uh, points per dollar to allow like more expensive optimal plays to get in your lineup. And and like you said, the the 3% on player is going to automatically, you know, make you super unique and not worry about being duplicated like 25 times. And that's a big pricing difference on FanDuel. Walker 7K, Charbonnet 5400, but they were just $100 apart on DraftKings. So obviously a much better play with the salary savings on FanDuel uh, and much more of a large field only play on DraftKings where they're basically the same price. So, um, all right, if we talk about two gamer now, we talk about, we talked about leaving salary a little bit, we talked about low ownership. And I think, you know, Jack, I, run our, I ran our builder this morning and looking on DraftKings specifically where I was running the builder, uh, I ran both strategies, forcing in low owned guys, forcing in mega stacks where we have at least four guys from one team, at least two guys from the opposing team. That way one game is higher scoring than the other. The low ownership runs wasn't too, uh, un- wasn't too, uh, it, it wasn't too surprising, right? Because Ridley popped up a lot. The Tennessee tight ends, John U. Smith, basically all the guys we talked about from the early game were popping up as the low owned plays that the builder was forcing in. And forcing in mega stacks, what I was surprised about, it was already including at least one low owned play for the most part, generally because Calvin Ridley is an underperforming wide receiver. But it didn't feel like the uh, the builder didn't feel like it was spitting out relatively equal versions of game stacks between Tennessee, Miami, and Detroit, Seattle, which I think you would not expect. So for me, if we can get much lower owned mega stacks in that first game, and our our builder is saying that that's a decent way to go, I think that's a great play, whether it's in low risk, or in small field, or or large field. Yeah, I mean, I think, and this is applicable to Showdown too. Um, but there's so many players in the second game that are capable of. Um, sort of like stealing all the points on the offense that I think it does. You could get a situation where, yeah. um, you know, Metcalf and Gibbs score like two touchdowns each. And that game finishes like 27, 24. And then the other game is sort of the same score, but the scoring is spread out enough that um, the optimal lineup is actually just using one or two of those guys from that game. Whereas the first game um, it's probably more going to be like, especially with, with Tennessee, right? You it's, if that game wins, it's probably, going to be more of like a spread out kind of effort um so yeah and i think um maybe, maybe we can transition to showdown a little bit in the, in that vein um you know i think 
on the flip side, the the non quarterback guys that steal all the points are great for showdown. And uh, I think you highlight in your notes here, Metcalf. Um, I mean, yeah, that's like for the showdown slate. Like he's a he's a great play. Um, I don't think his ownership is going to be that high. I'm gonna I'm gonna look. I forget what we have him at. I mean, it's super low owned. Just because that second game again in showdown, especially on DraftKings, the pricing is so tight. I'm st- I'm not sure what the field is going to do, right? If you look at optimal lineups from other sites, it's just punts from guys who might see like ten snaps at two hundred dollars. It's pretty crazy to think about. And and the first thing that comes to mind for me, Jack, when we have a slate with this tight of pricing, it's pretty it's relatively rare, right? It's 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 more common as we get into the season. But to have it this tight, generally we see winning lineups that loosen up some of the correlation rules. You'll see double kickers or kicker against uh, opposing running back or a defense against opposing captain or some st- or multiple receivers without a quarterback. Anytime you look at winning lines from these tight pricing slates, you look and say, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And then you realize that it's the pricing that just causes whatever can fit in ends up in the winning lineup. So I, I urge whoever is building lineups for this second game on DraftKings to not be as restrictive with your rules as you normally might be. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I think to, to sum up, like you, you said, I got off, uh, I got off in the showdown because of course I always want to talk about showdown. But for two game, salary's tight. Uh, you know, leave one to two Ks okay. You don't have to, but it's one way to do it. Um, definitely be mindful of like, you know, again the same question we always say: build the lineup with rules that make sense. Leave the salary flexible. Then look at it and say, and try to kind of swap up to more expensive players and say, all right. Can, can this guy outscore that guy? If the answer is yes, you can leave it. If the answer is most likely not, then uh, I want to switch it. But again, you know, I would say on a two gamer, Brian, you err on the side of like anything can happen, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> Danny DeVito was the optimal quarterback, <laughs> so just gonna use that every time. Every time. Um, and and then low own, like you said, kind of slam dunk and the overstacking. All four games are viable, especially. I mean, let's like again, Miami. Yeah, it's gross to play Huntley, but like Tyree Kill could catch a yard pass and run for 90 yards um and then they could optimal that stack right same with same with waddle so um they're all in play um yeah i think i think and is that kind of it for the the two gamer i'm trying to think if there's any other stuff we didn't cover no i think we we covered most of it i, I think you recapped it pretty nicely there and all three strategies are in play calvin ridley is the the biggest slam dunk at at lower ownership as an underperforming wide receiver uh, and I, I will, if we talk about showdown again, the first game, Tennessee, Miami, Jack, I got a lot of defensive captains in my first builds this morning. A lot of team defense captains, uh, pretty interesting with, uh, a third string quarterback and obviously Will Levis. There are so many ways you can go in that first game. So many different things can happen. It's a mu- it's, you couldn't have night and day showdowns like between the first one and the second one. Yeah. The first one, I mean, that game could end up like 13 to 10 or 35, 34, <laughs> yeah. who knows? Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm trying to get captains for the first one. I mean, I'm guessing Tyree Kill. I'm just looking at I'm guessing Tyree Kill won't be as high as he should be. I mean, yep. just because of the quarterback situation. Yeah, he. So, like, you know, looking at the kind of more popular sites, Tyree Kill is like the fourth high, fifth highest projected player on some of these sites, which is kind of really insane. Yeah. Like, like Tony Pollard and Will Levis are projected higher than Hill. Like, okay, cool. Um, I will play Tyree know. Kill. Um, <laughs> yep. Um, I mean, a chan will be super chalky, um, and you can play Ridley, right? Even on Fanduel, especially if it's a, if it's a lower scoring game, he goes over 100 scores touchdown. Yep. Um, second game, I guess I'll go first, then you can go. I, I you know, I just quickly looked at the ownership. I mean, Metcalf sub 10% MVP easily could get there, uh, and we always do this. David Montgomery, everyone wants to play Gibbs and yep. St. Brown. Everyone hates David Montgomery, but I'm, I mean, he's playing well and he's getting the ball and he's scoring. And if they're I think they're, I mean, they're favored by what four and a half. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's kind of just a no brainer play the home favorite running back that gets touchdowns and script is in his advantage when they're, when they're winning. Um, that's probably where I'd go tonight on that one. Okay. Fanduel. Yeah. And I think on DraftKings for me, the second game, Seattle, Detroit, I think it, it I don't think it's, it's, it's going to be optimal to punt a play tonight, whether it's $200 or $1,600, whatever it is. To me, the more optimal approach is playing a mid range captain in that 5 to 7K range. And then in that same price range, if you don't play a mid-range captain, I think you need like three guys from 4K to 7K. That feels like the more optimal approach to me. And our builder, when you put in some rules, that was the approach it was spitting out as well. So uh, a much more... The first game is, you know, very cookie cutter. You just put in your rules, build how you normally build. Second game is a lot more game theory driven. Uh, a lot more thinking is needed, which is always always fun to do on Showdown. So... 
Uh, Jack, I think that'll do it for this video. Appreciate you uh, joining me here before work. Thank you, as always. Any final thoughts on these two games? No, just uh, have fun. I think this is this is a good one. And uh, I think we probably don't get one of these again for a while. So enjoy it while you can. Play if you can. Absolutely. So if you're not subscribed to, if you're not subscribed to the channel already, please do so. It's free to do so. We're racing to 10,000 subscribers doing a giveaway once we get to 10K. So make sure you subscribe and are a part of that. You'll get notified when we go live, upload any new videos. Best free way to support the channel is just give a thumbs up. You would be surprised at how much that helps us out. Any questions about tonight's games, drop a comment below on the video. I will answer them before the game start at 7.15, 7.30 Eastern. Discord is the other way occupyfantasy.com slash discord chat with us and other members of the community come sweat the games out with us and our daily plug will be up this afternoon running down two game and showdown rankings and strategies model and build are already up with rankings and ownership so occupyfantasy.com is where you can get that extra edge for all of your lineups tonight for jack i am brian thanks everyone for listening and good luck on tonight's two gamer